to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ can anyone forbid water that they should not be baptized acts chapter 10 verse number 46 we welcome you today to our study of cases of conversion in the book of acts we're so glad that you've joined us we want to encourage you to find your bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the word of god in our study of what must a person do to be saved in the book of acts and so again we're so glad that you've joined us uh, we want to encourage you to visit the lord's church in your area Check out the Church of Christ. This lesson is being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Lord's Church in your area. I can promise you, at the Church of Christ, you'll find people who love God, who love others, and who are concerned about lost souls. If you've got a Bible question about anything we say today, you'd like to learn more about salvation or worship or the church, Friend, you'll find people there who'd love to study the Scripture with you. And so visit them on Sunday or on Wednesday. They'd be happy to have you. And friend, here at the Gospel of Christ, which is simply an evangelistic work of the Church of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. We want men and women, more than anything else, we're concerned about people's souls, not their wallets. We want you to go to heaven and to live with God eternally. And so won't you check out our website thegospelofchrist.com from there you can access all our material Bible study material free of charge we have videos we have audio lessons transcripts of our lessons study questions uh, just a wide variety of good Bible study material and it's all available free to you in fact if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson we'll make that available to you as well as all of our lessons Go to our website, thegospelofchrist.com, uh, fill out a me free media request form. Uh, from that, you can select whether you'd like to have a digital download that you can get on your computer or TV. You can access us through Roku and Vimeo as well uh, on your smart TV. Or if you'd like to actually have a DVD or CD, just select that on the free media request form and we'll be glad to send that to you free of charge. We'll even cover the postage in doing that. And so today, we're thinking about the, of the some 2,000 questions that are asked in the Bible. Today, we're thinking about the number one question. What must a person do to be saved? Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. Acts chapter 9, verses 4 through 6. Acts chapter 2, verse 36 and 37 mention that question as well. And so we're thinking about Cornelius. Let's begin by reading the introduction to who Cornelius is and what's happening in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 8. Would you read with me? The Bible says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa, and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. And when the angel who, had spoke, and when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now we learn here a little bit about the man Cornelius. Cornelius was a soldier. People who were uh, not always known for their religious tendencies. Not only was he a soldier though, he was a high-ranking officer as a soldier. A centurion was a captain 
over a hundred soldiers. Centurions, uh, history records for us, centurions were the backbone of the Roman ar army. His regiment was actually soldiers from Italy, and so they were in the Italian regiment, and there they were in, uh, where Peter is in, in Jerusalem, and Peter's working with them uh, to try to help teach them, uh, or he's going to be sent to them to help teach them uh, the gospel. And so we learn a little bit about Cornelius. He was indeed a Gentile. We know this because of the astonishment of their circumcision, Acts 10 verse 45. We also learn that he is classed by James and Peter among the Gentile converts in Acts 15 verse 7 and verse 14. And so we learn that he's a Gentile in background. He's a Roman soldier, but we also learn Cornelius is different than some people in his day. He's a religious man. He's a, the Bible says he was devout. Uh, Acts 10 verse 2, a devout man who prayed to God, a God-fearing man who prayed to God and gave alms generously to the people. The word devout means reverent. He's a reverent religious man, one who is zealous about God and religious things and who regularly engaged in worship. And so as a Gentile, worshiping under the patriarchal law, he's a man who honors and realizes God is the true God. He's a God-fearing man, literally a God-fearer, suggesting he was a Gentile who wanted to live his life in a way that devoted himself to God and understood the consequences if he did not do that. And so he's uh, a devout man, He's a God-fearing man, and he is a good, benevolent man. He, is a, he gave alms generously to the people to help them. This is a man who, although he may have had a, a little more means than other people, he was a very benevolent man. He was willing to help those in need financially. But here's what else we learn about Cornelius. He prayed to God always. He was a man of prayer. He recognized the importance of praying to God as we're taught in the Bible. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17. Uh, he, was a, he tried to be a righteous man. According to Acts 10, verse 22, he tried to be a righteous man and he had a good reputation. He, and so here we're not talking about, we're not talking about like Saul of Tarsus, one who is caught up in the heretical teaching of the Jews and who's out doing harm to people. We're not talking about some abject sinner who's living in rebellion to the will of God. Cornelius is a religious man under the patriarchal law who still needs to learn about Jesus Christ. He's yet to learn the truth about Jesus and he needs to be saved. And so Cornelius needs the gospel. Although a good man, although a moral man, although a religious person, it wasn't enough. Cornelius was still lost and needed to be saved. How do we know that? In Acts 10 verse 6, God tells Cornelius to send for Peter. He's going to tell him what he must do. There was a must Cornelius had to do. In fact, Acts 11:14 says this about their coming together. Of Simon coming to Cornelius, who will tell you words, listen to this, by which you and all your household will be saved. What do we learn about that? We learn, although a good man, although a moral man, although a religious man, without Jesus, Cornelius was still lost. Thus, he's in a vision. In that vision, God tells him, uh, Peter's in a vision, Cornelius is praying, and God speaks to Peter, tells him to, to go to Cornelius as well. Cornelius, uh, Peter's hesitant about this because as a Jew, he would have no dealings with Gentiles, and yet God makes it plain in this vision with this sheet of all these unclean animals. He makes it clean in the, clear in this vision that not to call anything clean that are common that God's cleansed. And so God's not talking about uh, people. God's talking about Cornelius and his family. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 15 and 16. This voice comes to Peter, trying to convince him to go to a Gentile, and a voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven. Well, what in the world is this all about? Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 28. 
Then Peter said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. Now watch this. God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And so Peter is convinced he's got to go take the gospel to him. And friend, as we think about this idea, there's a very powerful truth that I want us to learn here. And it's this. Color of skin, nationality, social, economic, educational status, all those barriers were broken down with the gospel. Friend, you will never find anything that is more unprejudiced and unracial than the gospel. Go into all the world. Teach the gospel to every creature. Baptize all nations. Matthew 28, 18 following. Mark 16 to verse 15. And, and here we see this. Peter said, God told me not to call anything he's cleansed unclean. And here I am talking to these Gentiles today. And thus that had to teach that the Gentiles had been brought into the kingdom of God. And friend, the lesson again is this. There's no big me and little you. There's no color barrier. There's no racial barrier. There's no nationality barrier, economic, gender, none of that. All men stand on level ground at the foot of the cross. All men need the gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved. And so Peter comes to Cornelius and he's going to tell him about this. Look in Acts chapter 10 and I want you to look beginning in verse number 24 and watch what Peter says when he comes to Cornelius and what Cornelius does. Look at Acts 10 verse 24. And the following day Peter and his entourage entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them and he had called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I myself am also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many who had come together. Then he said to them, You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or to go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Therefore I came without objection as soon as I went. For I asked then, For what reason have you sent for us? Or Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour. At the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayers have been heard. Your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging at the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea. When he comes, he'll speak to you. So I sent to you immediately. You've done well to come. Now watch this. Now therefore we're all present before God to hear all things commanded you by God. Why did Cornelius send for Peter to hear what God wanted him to do? And Cornelius came without hesitation, but, you know, there's something here that happened that helps us to dispel a little bit of false doctrine that's in our world today. Cornelius, a Gentile, invites Peter, a Jew, to come to his house, and that was unheard of as we read from the text. Peter knocks on the door. Cornelius is so overwhelmed that he would come that he falls down on his knees before him and attempts to worship him. Friend, what did Peter do? Did Peter say, here's my ring and you like my hat, you want to kiss my ring too? Peter think he was the first pope and accept his worship? No, Peter didn't do that. That idea is not found in the Bible. Peter said this, Cornelius, you need to stand up. I'm a man too. I'm just like you. Peter did not accept Cornelius' worship. Peter, if he was it, Peter didn't know he's the first pope. And friend, he wasn't the first pope. We know that from teaching in the Bible. There is not such a thing as that. In fact, Peter was actually married. You can read in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 5, as an elder, he would have to be married when you put in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 there. But what I'm trying to show you is this. Peter didn't accept worship, and men today should not have other men kiss the ring or fall down before them and worship and think of them as some great pontiff who's deserving of their worship. And so Cornelius just wants to hear what God has for him to do. And so now 
Peter is going to preach the gospel to Cornelius and his household and tell them what they've got to do to be saved. Let's look in our Bible in Acts chapter 10. Look in verses 34 following. What did they have to do to be saved? Look in Acts 10 verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation who fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, He is Lord of all. That word you know, which was proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us, who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that it is he who is ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, Whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Now notice, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water? that these should not be baptized who receive the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. What happened during the conversion of Cornelius? And what must men and women do today based on this pattern also? Well, friend, there's some very important truths that we learn here. Number one, we learn from the words of Peter that God's not prejudiced. Listen to this. I, in truth, I perceive God shows no partiality. Friend, the God of the Bible is an impartial, unprejudiced God. God doesn't, God's not concerned with the exterior barriers that men so often put up. God's not concerned with that at all. He's not a partial God. Anybody who fears Him and works righteousness will be accepted by Him. Regardless of all the barriers men try to put up, if you'll be a God-fearer and you'll do what God says, you can rest assured. You can be a child of God and in good graces with God. And then Peter preaches the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. That Jesus died for our sins. Friend, I've got to come to the realization and I've got to understand Jesus died for my sins. He Himself bore our sins in his own body upon the tree, that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes we are healed. I've sinned and you've sinned. For the Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so he preaches about the death of Jesus. He preaches about Jesus' burial, that he was killed, buried in the grave, but that the grave could not contain him, and that he arose out of that grave, and that he conquered death and sin. And, and no doubt, as is always the case in preaching that, we're reminded that as God's people to obey the gospel, we've got to die to sin, we've got to be buried with Christ in baptism, and we've got to rise out of that watery grave to walk in newness of life. Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4. Peter also preaches that Jesus is the judge of the living and the dead. Listen again to the last part of verse number 42. It is God who ordained him to be judge of the living and the dead. Friend, Peter preached about the judgment day. And I wonder, is it something that we think about very much? Do we really think about the fact that one day all of us are going to leave this life and one day we're all 
going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to give an account for the things done in this body, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. Do we really see that day when the small and great are standing before God and books are open and another book is open, which is the book of life, and the dead are judged according to the things written therein? Do we factor in the judgment day into our thinking? Now, if you're a child of God, we can have boldness on the day of judgment, John would say. But if not, we need to be cognizant of that as we think about salvation. Then Peter brings it to a climax, and he preaches salvation in Jesus. Look in Acts 10, verse 43 again. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. How can a person be forgiven of sins through Jesus' name? By committing your life to Jesus Christ. Friend, if a person's going to be saved, the only way to be saved, is through Jesus. Isn't that what Peter said in Acts 4 verse 12? Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And so P Peter preached salvation in Jesus. Now no doubt believing in Him is essential to salvation. Look at the things that are occurring in Acts 10 in this conversion. They had to hear the Word of God, right? They had to hear preaching that Jesus is the way and you can't be saved without Him. Just like people today. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Did these people have to believe? Sure, you've got to believe in His name to have eternal life, Peter said in Acts 10, verse 43. And throughout the Bible, we learn that we've got to believe. Uh, Acts 8, uh, verse 36 through 38, here's water, what hinders you me? If you believe with all your heart, you may. And so, yes, a person must believe. But, friend, don't stop short at just belief. The, there are passages that will say, here, here's what we learn. We've got to put everything the Bible says together on salvation. Are there passages that teach a person has to repent to be saved? Sure. Acts 3.19, Peter preached, repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Are there passages that teach we must confess? Absolutely. Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father. Are there passages that teach you've got to believe? Sure. John 3, 16. God so loved the world that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Are there passages that teach one must be baptized to be saved? Absolutely. Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. And so what we're trying to get at is let's put everything the Bible says together on salvation, and yes, belief is a part of that. But the Bible also teaches faith alone will never save. James 2 verse 24 clearly teaches faith only is not what's going to save people today. Well, then we notice something amazing happen. Now, Peter says, this happened to us at the beginning. Just what happened to us happens to these Gentiles. In Acts chapter 2, to the twelve, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They were able to speak with tongues. And we've got God opening up the doors of the kingdom to come into that for the Jews in Jerusalem. Peter said, just what happened to us at the beginning has happened to them. The Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles as a sign that the doors of the kingdom now were open for the Gentiles as well. And so now the doors are wide open. Jew and Gentile both, the Holy Spirit has signified they can both come into the kingdom of God. And so with that, Peter sees that. They're, they receive the Holy Spirit. They're able to speak in tongues because they're in the age of the miraculous where that's occurring. And now Peter says, with this sign showing they can come into the kingdom, can anyone forbid water that these be baptized just as we were? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they urged him to stay with them a few days. Friend, Water was not forbidden for these people. That is, they were told to be baptized just like everybody else who's converted is taught to be baptized. Please understand me well today. The Bible teaches that for a person to be saved, they must be baptized. Let me ask you this. Can you reject a command of God and be saved? Well, of course not. Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, It's not everybody that looks up in heaven and says, Lord, Lord, is going there, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so you cannot reject the commands of God and be saved, right? 
He commanded them to be baptized. Baptism is a command of God. Does the Bible teach baptism is something you must do to be saved? Jesus taught it and Peter taught it. Mark 16, 16, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Did, did Jesus say you've got to believe and be baptized to be saved? If He did, why would we ever say baptism is not essential? Acts 2 verse 38, On the day of Pentecost, Peter preached, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Does the Bible say baptism is for in order to receive the remission of sins? And here's probably the clearest of all. 1 Peter 3.21, Peter said this, Baptism does now also save us. Friend, can I ask you this today? If the Bible says baptism saves us, and it does, because that's where we contact the blood of Jesus, Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, we're baptized into His death. If the Bible says baptism saves us, and it does, why would anybody say baptism's not essential to salvation? Are there passages that teach you've got to repent and hear and believe? And yeah, there are all those passages, but there are also passages that teach you have to be baptized. And so what are we saying? Let's put everything God says together. Let's put the total, here it is, Psalm 119, 160. The entirety, the sum, the totality of your word is truth. When you put everything together, then we know what God wants us to do to be saved. And so, friend, from the bottom of our heart today, we're asking you, have you done what people in the Bible did to be saved? Have you been converted the way people were converted in the book of Acts? You don't read about saying a sinner's prayer. You don't read about belief only saving. You don't read about putting your hand on the TV and receive. No, that's not what we, what do we hear? We've got to hear the word. We've got to believe in Jesus. We've got to repent of sin. We've got to confess his name and we must be baptized to be saved. And friend, that's what people in the Bible did. And those people were saved and we can know we're saved if we do what the scripture says. And so if you've not done that, we urge you today to obey the gospel. And we urge you to join us next time as we're going to study more about the gospel of Christ. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, streaming, free media, and internet. Our motto is truly to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. This is the Gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call. 844-6-GOSPEL. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the